Hi, and welcome back to my channel. It is Johanna Frenert, and I'm here today to teach you Business Management 2.3. This is all about leadership and management. So the first thing to go through is what are the key functions of management? So what do managers need to do? So we're going to base this off sort of a model or a theory, you could call it, by Henry Fayol. I'm definitely saying that wrong, and I don't think you need to know his name, but that is his name. I'll write it down here on the board. What he said is that a manager must do P-O-C-C-C, -C, which is planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating, and controlling. So I am quite sure you know what these things mean. However, I will explain them anyway. So planning, obviously a manager needs to set objectives, whether they are operational, tactical, or strategic. Um, organizing, making sure that you have the resources you need to meet those objectives. Commanding, they must delegate to the different employees who has to do what. The employees need to know what they need to do. Coordinating means um, bringing together the various resources that will meet the objectives. And controlling, this means that they have to have power over the situation and make sure things are done properly. Having like quality checks and stuff like that would count as controlling. The next thing to go through is what is the difference between management and leadership? So um, what you have to think about now are certain aspects. For instance, a manager instructs and a leader inspires, motivates. It's really important to remember that the leader is the person who's creative, who's coming up, or innovative, who's coming up with the ideas, the enterprise of the business. We know a manager has been hired to meet um, objectives. They're being paid by the business to do a job. Meanwhile, the leader, well, of course, the leader is also getting profit and money and stuff, but the leader has created this business. So what a manager might do is resolve problems between different employees. Meanwhile, a leader likes to take risks, you know, experience new things, see what happens, push the boundaries. Um, management, they have authority um, by their position in the company over like their subordinates. Meanwhile, the leader has the vision, you know, they are creative, they have the ideas. And the management, because they are hired by the business, they don't want to challenge the organization. They're not going to sit there and be like, no, we're going against the general wants of the organization. Meanwhile, the leader wants to push boundaries. It wants to challenge and it wants to change and innovate constantly. So the last part of this chapter is to talk about different leadership styles and you have to identify the positives and the negatives of it. And if you're given a case study, you have to be able to say, oh, it's this one and not that one. So there are five different ones the book mentions. There's autocratic, paternalistic, democratic. Then there's one that I can't pronounce, but it's like lazes, farie, and situational. So we're going to go through each one now. So we'll begin with autocratic. So in an autocratic leadership style, the leader holds as much power and decision-making authority as they possibly can. They usually do not ask the employees for input or anything like that. They don't do any consulting. However, I mean, technically speaking, you could still be autocratic and ask a little bit. It just, like, you, the majority of decisions should be made by you. But to for a more like simplistic version, we'll say no consulting happens at all. So in this type of style, your employees are likely to be unskilled and their ideas are not valued or untrusted. These are basically people where the leader just goes, says, do this, do that, do that. And if you don't do it, then you're screwed. Okay, there's like no discussion. It's like, okay, file these papers, do this, do that. You know, there's lots of rules. Now, obviously, if your employees are not unskilled and trusted and their ideas are valued, then this style would not work. Because if you have creative people that want to like do their own thing, this style would be absolutely terrible because they have no freedom to do anything. The lines of authority are super clear, so this type of style could be very clear and easy for an employee to understand. It's like I know exactly what I have to do and I'll just do it. Obviously decisions can be made a lot quicker because it's only made by one person or like a few people rather than having to consult every single person. A very big disadvantage is that employees don't learn how to manage themselves. So if they wanna go up in the ranks, 
or like the hierarchy, then they'll have to be trained and stuff like that because the actual job itself will not teach them anything. In this style of leadership, you're not likely to have employees that develop any new skills because they're simply just doing tasks that are very easy or very one-sided. So the next one is paternalistic. As you can probably tell by the names, that they very much correlate with the meaning. So if you're talking about paternal, you're thinking about father figure, like a family and all that. And that is exactly what this type of leadership style is. You see the whole company or like the, all of the employees or project or whatever you're doing is a family. So there's a lot of loyalty and there's a sense of safety and you trust everyone and loyalty is really valued. Now the leader still has authority, um, but they do value employees. It's, it's, the leader is essentially like the father figure. I know that's like a little bit stereotypical right now because obviously your mother could be like the person making all the decisions, but in this case, it is like the father figure of the company. Um, obviously there are a lot of positives here because your employees are usually um, very loyal and they'll be willing to work for you and they'll, they'll stay with your company. They won't leave for something better even if it pays more, you know, stuff like that. Um, however, there's an issue where potentially that the leader might play favorites or it might seem like they're playing favorites because there is this sense of community and family and if someone keeps getting all the good tasks or whatever, it might seem like the leader is valuing one over the other. You all know like same issues that are in a family. Just think about a family and then you can identify this whole leadership style. Very much like sibling rivalry type of thing. The next one is democratic. This sort of speaks for itself. Essentially what this means that the managers involve the employees into the decision making and inform them about the issues that affect them. That is pretty much it. Obviously, if you're letting everybody make decisions, then it slows down the decision making process because then you have to consult every single person in the business. So if you're in a situation where maybe a crisis has happened, then this might not be the best leadership style because it'll take you longer to respond. So now to the one I cannot pronounce. So what this means uh, in English is to leave alone. And that is essentially what this is. Essentially, the managers give the employees the freedom to work as they want. They can make their own goals, they make their own decisions, they resolve problems as they see fit. Essentially, they make their own schedule. Now, of course, the manager might tell them, you have to get this task done, but they're allowed to get it done in any way that they seem is, you know, fitting in any way they want. This could be good for very skilled employees and creative employees and obviously they have to be super motivated because they have to keep track of themselves and make sure they're doing all the work. If your employees are not those things, then obviously the style would not work as well. I know for myself, I would probably have a very hard time with this because it seems sort of overwhelming and not confusing per se, but um, since there isn't clear guidance, I would probably have an issue with doing it because I would just like be stuck at the idea that I have so much freedom and I'm very indecisive, so it wouldn't work for me, but it might work for some people. Another issue with this leadership style is the fact that you're trusting your employees so much and the individual employee might have aims and aspirations that are very different than what the vision of the actual organization is. So it's important to make sure that you are not deviating from the actual organization's goal too much, which may happen if you use this leadership style. Now on to the last style. I have a feeling I started to get tired when I was writing this because my handwriting became like so much worse. But anyway, this is the situational type of leadership style. Now I won't say too much about this because it's quite obvious what it is. Basically different situations require different styles. Um, obviously this is good because you are adapting to the situation. However, this can be confusing for employees if you change too often because then it's unclear how much freedom they can take and how many, like what part they have in the business. Can they make decisions? Can't they? You know, stuff like that. Now, the very, very last thing to go through is how ethics affects leadership and how cultural differences affect leadership. So we're going to look at how ethics affects leaders and how ethics affects managers. So there's sort of a saying you can use where you say that leaders do the right thing, meanwhile managers do things right. 
this is a very good way to think about it. So leaders, they are focused on the people. They want to make sure the people are good. Meanwhile, the managers are focused on the actual organization. Obviously, this doesn't mean that if a manager is, let's say, harassing one of its employees, acting in an unethical way, that they aren't being unethical because they're, you know, focusing on the organization. Like, no, obviously anyone who's acting in a way where they're putting their own interests above others is not doing their job properly. There is no room in a company for unethical behavior, so I just want to make that super clear. What is actually meant by all of this is that a leader is more likely to risk their own um, position or whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll go out of their way to protect their employees. Meanwhile, managers will also do that, but they won't risk their position. They'll go through the real procedures and rules of the business, like they'll go through HR and stuff like that, as well as managers will think, let's say they have an employee who is harassing other employees. They will not only think, oh no, like poor, like the people who are being harassed, but also think about the image that the organization will get if it gets out that someone was harassing employees. So for cultural differences, we'll be uh, taking use of Hofstede's psychological study where he sent out surveys to um, people in a company in different countries to see what the differences are in the environment depending on the country or culture that they live in. So he identified five different aspects. So there was a power distance, individualism versus collectivism, uncertainty avoidance, um, masculinity versus femininity, and then long-term orientation versus short-term orientation. Now, you don't have to like know what all of these things mean. However, you should probably know what a few of them mean. So an individualistic society is something more like, let's say Sweden, you care about your individual aspirations. Meanwhile, in China, you might think of your family unit as more of a thing. Like you take care of your elders, like they stay in your house. Meanwhile, in Sweden, you would probably send them off to like a, like a housing, like elderly home thing. Um, then there is power distance. This is like, uh, or and uncertainty avoidance are both sort of related to like, how comfortable are you with like talking to someone um, of authority. So power distance, right? If you have very high power distance, then you are more likely to be in an autocratic leadership style because then you, you really like value and respect someone of power or like whatever. I don't know what to call it, but you know what I mean? So you're not expected to make decisions and like do all that stuff. You're not expected to speak directly to your authority. Meanwhile, if you were in a low power distance, uh, country or culture, then you would maybe have a more democratic style, you know, stuff like that. And then obviously long-term orientation and short-term orientation is sort of self-explanatory. Um, there is masculinity versus femininity, which I think is a bit of an iffy way to refer to these things, but essentially cultures that are more about nurturing and stuff like that will be considered more feminine. But you know, anyway, so, um, you know, a paternalistic style might be more comfortable in a collectivistic society, you know, stuff like that. So that was it for chapter 2.3 about leadership and management. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and comment. I will be making more videos very soon. You can follow me at Johanna Frenard on Instagram if you want to, I don't know, DM me or text me something interesting. I don't know. Um, you know, feel free. Unless you're rude, then don't do that. Goodbye. I hope you learned something.